Only seven, seven pages. We're, we're in business. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I don't know what happened to Mother Nature. She's sitting down on the job because I was getting really used to those 80 degree days. It's, it's like 50 outside or something. Anyway, um, I want to thank all of you again for coming out tonight in this weather and also to all of those folks who will be watching by way of YouTube. I hope that you will all be blessed by the message that the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart. Now, the title of this message is The Gospel in 30 Minutes or Less. Or less. Um, our main text is going to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So while you're turning there, I'll tell you a little story. I had bet my sister the other day that I could do the same thing in 30 seconds. And I bet her lunch, but since she wouldn't take me up on it, y'all are going to have to listen to the long version tonight. So we're going to start in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in chapter 3, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, verse 3. For I delivered unto you the first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time." Again, this is Paul speaking. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Now the gospel message, the good news in its purest, plainest, simplest form is that Jesus Christ, who was fully God, was also born fully human as a tiny baby boy. He lived a completely sinless life. He died at around the age of 33 for the sins of Every person, born and yet to be born. He was buried for three whole days. He rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was seen bodily by a number of witnesses, individually and in groups, before he ascended back into heaven to return to his former glory and grandeur and stature. This is precisely what we just read in those verses in 1 Corinthians 15. Now before I get into the part about the um, gospel message itself, a couple of things that we need to remember that I talked about. God, as Jesus Christ, was born as a tiny baby boy. According to Matthew 1.23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall, name, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Luke 2, 6 and 7 says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Second thing we need to know is that he lived a completely sinless human life. 1 John 3, 5 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And as he was being brought before Pilate to be sentenced to death, we can read this in Luke chapter 23, verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in the man. So the first part of the gospel message is that he died for the sins of all mankind. He did. He died a physical death. 
Now, this is according to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, New Testament scriptures. He even himself prophesied his own death. 1 John 2.2 2 said, And he is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Romans 5.8 But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Galatians 1, 3 through 5, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, to me, the most intriguing part of the gospel message is this three-day period between the crucifixion, the last breath that Jesus took until his resurrection. He died too, according to the scriptures. Now there's scant information in scripture about what actually transpired during those three days. It's more conjecture probably than anything else. However, we do have some glimpses in Scripture what possibly could have happened. And, you know, we have multiple biblical references, and with a little bit of detective work, we can go in and kind of get an idea, possibly, of what happened, where, how, that kind of thing. So that's, I'd like to do that for a minute. Just kind of indulge me, if you will. Jesus' physical body died on the cross, but His spirit not the Holy Spirit, the internal man, was elsewhere. Three days later, his body and spirit were reunited and he rose bodily from the grave. So where was Jesus' spirit in the interim? Those three days. Ecclesiastes 12.7 says this, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Okay. The Bible tells us that God did not allow Christ's body to decay or to see corruption. Since Jesus was not only fully human, but he was also fully God, did he retain his own spirit? There's an indication possibly of what happened during this time if we go back and listen to the conversation between the thief that was crucified with him on the cross at Gethsemane. Um, this believing thief, this penitent thief, asked to be remembered when Jesus comes into his kingdom. Luke 23 verse 43 says this, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So where is paradise? And what is paradise? Now some people believe that paradise and the so-called bosom of Abraham uh, are the same place. Others, not so much. You remember the story in Luke about um, the story about the beggar named Lazarus and the rich man it says that they both died and the rich man went to hell and was in torment there but it also says that Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham it describes this these two places as being separated by a wide gulf or a chasm between the two When he gets there, or when they get there, this rich man who's in hell, he can feel, he can, um, he can converse, he can see. Uh, all of the things that a normal person like us can do, he was able to do. But we don't hear anything else about the beggar once he gets there. All it tells us is that he is with Abraham. But this guy, the rich man, carries on a conversation with Abraham asking him to send the beggar back to warn his family 
so that they'll repent and not wind up in the same place that he is. But to no avail because Abraham tells them they didn't listen to the prophets. What makes you think they'll listen to somebody who comes back from the dead? All right, so knowing that, that this place exists, all right, there's another place. 1 Peter 3.19 says this, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay, so what could that possibly mean? It's possible that Jesus went to hell or Hades or Sheol, which uh, whether you're looking at the Hebrew definition or the Greek definition, this is the abode of the dead. So it's very possible that Jesus actually went to this place to make some type of announcement to the spirits who were there. Now, if he went there and did this to the demonic spirits that were there, it would probably be a message, I would think, of his victory over Satan and all of the demons. See, the demons cannot be redeemed. Satan will never be redeemed. Judgment's already been passed on them. That's why the lake of fire was designed for Satan and his angels. So there is no way that they can ever be redeemed. Now, if it's a human audience that they're talking about here, these righteous people, I'm sorry, but I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. I'm, I was very interested as I was researching this that if he was going to give a message to these people that were in this compartment that was separate from the torment side of hell where people were designated for eternal punishment, I got to thinking about that and I thought, okay, wait a second here. When you die, your body deteriorates. So there would be no human body there. And it says that the spirit goes back to him who gave it. So I also got to thinking about the soul. Does the soul die? You know, if you go all the way back to Genesis... It talks about God forming man out of the dust of the ground. And then it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living, breathing soul. So all through the Bible, um, breath and the Holy Spirit are almost interchangeable. So I wondered if the Holy Spirit is what creates life in a person, when that person dies, is the Spirit taken from that person and that causes death? But does it kill the soul? I want to tell you a little something here. I found two verses in the Bible. One is Psalm 68, 18. And the other one is Ephesians 4, 8 and 10, which I'm going to read in just a second. And they both reference something that happens I think, during that three-day time period. So this is what uh, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10 says. Listen very carefully. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Let me read that again. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descendeth is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now I believe the captives that he's talking about here are these people in this compartmentalized area in Sheol. These were people who... I believe, were believers who had been uh, justified in life and then died in faith, never having seen salvation, but being promised salvation. Okay, So what is this singular one-time event that is referred to here? Here's the gospel according to Russ. This is what I think very possibly could have happened during that time. Jesus died on the cross 
an atoning death to gain salvation for all people. It says that after Jesus died, he became the first fruits of all those who would follow. So what I think happened was that when he went to Hades or Sheol, this abode of the dead, I believe that what he did was he went there, he gathered up all of these Old and New Testament saints, he removed them out of this section of Sheol, and then I believe that he took them to this new place, paradise, which would be their new spiritual home. Again, that's just my thought. I think that it would be noteworthy to note some of the people who may possibly have been in this, I hate using the word holding place or whatever, but I can't think of a better word to describe it. You remember, we're talking about people like um, Noah, Moses, um, Joshua, David, all of the prophets, um, even people like uh, the beggar, Lazarus, who was there, uh, the penitent thief on the cross. All of these people would have, once they died, been in this particular place, I believe. Okay? So, where was paradise? If it wasn't the same thing as this compartment. Well, Paul gives us an idea himself. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4, listen to this. Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, get that, third heaven, um, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So it's very possible that when Jesus took these captives out of Hades, that he took them above the actual abode of God to this place, paradise, where they now await the rapture of the church where they can now be reunited with their glorified bodies. Now again, nothing concrete here, but there's a lot of possibilities. And I just thought that was a very interesting section of this place. What in the world was going on for three days? So food for thought, okay? All right, then lastly, Jesus was raised to new life by the power of the Holy Spirit at the end of those three days. And over a period of 40 days, he was seen by a multitude of witnesses, individuals, and in groups, okay? This also according to the scriptures. Matthew 17, 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Remember I told you before that Jesus prophesied his own death and resurrection. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Acts 10, 40 and 41, and verse 43. Him God raised up the third day, and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Hallelujah. The first person to see the risen Lord was Mary Magdalene. She was at the tomb. Then he was seen by the women who had come to prepare the body after his death. 
He was also seen by two men who were walking on the road to Emmaus. Now, granted, they didn't have a clue who he was until he revealed himself to, her, uh, to them later. So, that, beloved, is the gospel message in 30 minutes or less. I'm not sure exactly how many minutes it is, but I think we got in under the wire. But I want to end this message tonight by giving you something that has nothing really to do with this, the, the gospel message. But I want to tell you that the eight appearances of Jesus to all of these different folks, these groups of people, when that happened over the, a period of 40 days, there was an equal number of victories over something. Want to know what they were? Here we go. Appearance number one was, again, to Mary Magdalene, who was weeping at the tomb, thinking that she had lost her Lord, her King, forever and ever, when he appeared to her, and she thought he was the gardener until he spoke to her. And it changed her uh, demeanor to one of just absolute joy, bringing a victory over despair. Parents number two, the other women that were with her that had come to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body because they assumed that he was dead. So they were going to do that. This was um, the other ones that were named, and there were several of them, uh, Mary, the mother of James, um, Salome, Joanna, I think, were two or three of them that were named. Um, but he appeared to all of them, and they all fell down and worshipped him, bringing victory over death. They finally realized, he isn't dead, he's alive. Parents number three, again, was the two guys on the road to Emmaus. They were walking along, talking with each other, discussing the entire week's events concerning Jesus. And they couldn't understand any of what happened. So Jesus started walking along with them. And he says in the Bible that he explained the Old Testament scriptures, everything concerning him until they did understand what was going on with him, bringing victory over confusion. Appearance number four was to the ten apostles, minus Thomas, who were hiding out from the Jews because they were scared to death that they would be suffering the same fate that Jesus had because of their association with him. And just like that, she, they're in a locked room and Jesus is there too. that brought victory over fear because they were scared and when he appeared to them, took that away. Parents number five was to all 11 of the remaining <clears throat> apostles, including Thomas, who had originally doubted that Jesus uh, had been resurrected from the grave, bringing victory over doubt. Number six, this was to seven of his disciples, including Peter, who was the one who had denied even knowing Jesus three times. It was here where Jesus restored Peter back into the ministry, bringing victory over failure. Parents number seven was to 11 of the apostles at a prearranged location on a mountainside. Uh, this was prior to his ascension. Uh, this was in Galilee. This is where Jesus confided to all of them that he had been given all power over all, all things, power and authority. It was where he detailed the great commission that all of his apostles and us were to go out and make disciples of everyone, bringing victory over any other power on the earth. And then, appearance number eight, it says to as many as 500 believers, and there were others in here. This is just a very basic rundown of what happened. But he confirmed the completion of his ministry, his earthly ministry. He promised to send the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost. And then he later ascended into heaven. And that brought victory over all things, 
all things. So I hope that all of you enjoyed this. I pray that it's been as much of a blessing to you as it was to me receiving it and bringing it to you. Now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make His face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Shalom. Go with the peace of God.